And we're back. You're listening to the Talking Boxing with Billy C. Show. You're watching us on the Fight Now television channel. And if you don't have Fight Now in your sports channel lineup, you need to call your local television provider and tell them that you want Fight Now right now. It's that simple. Pick up the phone and call. For all the information about the channel, you can find it on their website, www.fightnow.com. And speaking of now, uh, well, I, I, I guess I should just do... And hopefully you know what that intro music is. It's time for another episode of In the Ring with Billy C. and Steve Lott. And Steve Lott joins us right now. What's up, brother? Good morning, Billy. The uh, Boxing Hall of Fame here needs a new fighter. What do you weigh? Hey, you know what? I don't know if I can handle the fight, but I'd like to go out there and at least meet all the, the patrons that are coming in. I mean, how's it going, bro? It's going terrific. The uh, exhibits are, are very, very exciting, of course. Being next to baseball, football, basketball at the uh, score attraction at the Luxor, uh, the Hall of Fame itself, boxing, you know, it's, it's just great to walk in there and see Joe Lewis, Jack Dempsey, Rocky Marciano, especially the video. You know, people have forgotten what kind of great punchers and exciting fighters these, these great legends were. And it's nice to have them next to the Babe Ruths and the Woody Mays and the Will Chamberlain. So it's, it's wonderful. Yeah, I, I tell you, we have the we have the uh, the banner up. Uh, the link is up on the website. So uh, if anybody's looking to check it out, just go to www.billycboxing.com. You can't miss it. It's right on the front page. It links you right to the Las Vegas uh, Boxing Hall of Fame. And uh, I was banging around the website there, Steve, uh, uh, and I might as well ask you. You know, you got some of those. Are, are they are they the the uh, video or are they the audio? The the um, the Bill Caton collection. The Bill Caton collection is audio. It's okay. just audio. Some of the great fights. The uh, uh, radio broadcast started really to be able to be recorded in the early 30s, beginning like with the uh, Bear Conera era. And from then on, almost everything was recorded of, of note. Some of the recordings still exist, some don't. But fortunately, there's a lot of stuff of, of Joe Lewis, of Armstrong, you know, Robinson, Pep, in the era where the fights were not filmed, or if they were filmed, they don't exist. So... Uh, especially broadcasts like the uh, second Pep Sadler fight at Madison Square Garden. Uh, 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 Pep had lost the title to Sadler uh, the year before, and in the rematch, there's only the audio that exists. And the uh, Don Dumfrey call, the the radio, unbelievable, the excitement in the arena as Pep is outboxing Sandy here in the last round, he's scoring with Jets, unbelievable stuff. So fortunately... The radio does exist. You know, those guys knew how to call a fight, man. They had to they had to paint the picture, and not only were they describing the action, but they had to make sure that they painted that picture. You know, today when we call fights, and I, I know I do uh, blow by blow. It's easy because all I have to really do is is comment on on what's happening in front of me. Those guys had to paint the picture, man. Well, they were doing that. Every day. Remember, there was a lot of radio broadcasts back then. They also did television. They lived and breathed boxing. Many of them had columns as well. And they did so much stuff, you know, whether it was Steve Ellis, who came along in the late 50s and 60s, Don Dumphy after that, Bill Corm in the 40s and uh, early 50s with Joe Lewis. Two things. Number one, they had incredible voices. They had a twang on their voices, uh, something like a Mel Allen in baseball. And they knew how to talk. They knew when to shut up. They were just masters. That's why it lasted for for decades. Yeah, no, I I, I love listening to that. And uh, you know, we gotta we, we gotta do this show, man. We should be doing my show every day out of your Hall of Fame. I mean, that's where we should be, man. That's that's the place. Talk about uh, uh talk about having uh, chills. You know, being able to do that uh, with all the all the great film and and that whole that whole atmosphere there. Well, the only problem is the waitresses. They are very big and they're very rough. I don't know whether or not you'd be able to make your way through them to get to the production booth. Hey, you know what? I, I, I'll take my chances. I'll take my chances, you know. But uh, okay. hey, hey, today, you know, I, I wanted to ask you your, your opinion on some stuff. And, and, it, and it's kind of like, I, I don't know, man. I don't know how I want to present it. But basically, I'm gonna, I just randomly picked 10 all-time great fighters. 
And I, based on your knowledge of watching film of these guys, and, and maybe I, I have uh, uh, one or two or several uh, in this list that uh, uh, you, you didn't get the opportunity to watch because the films don't exist. But the question is going to be, first, were they great based on what you saw on, on film? And then why are they great? And, and I, you know, I, I think that uh, what I'm trying to do here is, is put in perspective We've been uh, battling uh, the last couple of weeks, you know, all-time greats. You know, how would those fighters of yesteryear uh, stand up to today's more athletic, uh, you know, boxer? So um, 10 all-time greats in no particular order. Of course, the first one, though, is Sugar Ray Robinson. Was he a great fighter and why? Uh, obviously, the answer is yes. Uh, he was a great fighter. Uh, first of all, to, you know, put a definition of greatness Usually, it's uh, longevity. How long was the fighter around? How many fights did he have? And what kind of success did he have in the ring? And obviously, you know, winning the middleweight championship, you know, five times and fighting in the 40s with all those killers back then, you know, fighting Lamada six times. Uh, Robinson was perhaps the greatest pure puncher of all time. Just probably the greatest puncher of all time. And that's what made him stand out, that if you stood toe-to-toe -to -toe at any time in the fight with him, uh, it's most likely you're going to be taken out. And that's, interestingly enough, what uh, is uh, not seen by the boxing historians. They rather refer him or categorize him as a, a, a boxer. But he was really a puncher because he got hit with everything. Uh, a boxer is someone who, who can be evasive and elusive. So he definitely was great because of his punching power. Yeah, that's interesting. You're right. Most people do look at him as a great boxer, and 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 uh, you know, based on uh, what you've seen, he, he was hit. Uh, he was hit a lot. He hit easily. Um, the thing is, is that a lot of his video from when he was, you know, really good uh, as a welterweight don't exist. So we we really got to see him on film uh, in his in his second career, so to speak, as a middleweight. Yes, uh, there are a few home movies uh, of his fights in the uh, late 40s, um, and you could see that he was you know, a, a sensational fighter back then, a tremendous puncher, uh, and that's what made him stand out is that punching ability, but he got hit, and he was great, the longevity, fighting you know, from 40 to 65, a 25-year span, and the guys he fought moving up to, to light heavyweight to fight Joey Maxim. And he would have won the fight had the fight been indoors when it was cooler rather than a 120 degree Yankee Stadium heat. Uh, so his his longevity was was spectacular. That's what makes him stand out. You know, it's funny. I, I that story uh, that that fight always comes up, and people always make that comment. Oh, he would have won. You know, if it wasn't so hot and humid and everything else. And I and I distinctly remember a comment that Joey Maxim made after that fight. He says, "Hey." It's not like I had fans on me in my corner. It was just it was just as hot and disgusting in my corner, and it's true. You know, both fighters had to endure uh, uh, those conditions. But uh, you know, you make an interesting point about greatness uh, being synonymous with longevity. Well, let me jump to to this guy, Stanley Ketchel. You know, he was around. A lot of people regard him as an all time great fighter, uh, but yet he he left us kind of early in in some weird circumstances. Was he a great fighter, and why? Well, uh, fortunately, there are a few fights that exist. Um, you know, his, his fight with uh, with uh, Papke, and of course the Jack Johnson fight. I think if the Jack Johnson fight never took place, his uh, legend would be much, much, much less. Because if you look at him in the in the Papke fight, very ordinary, very ordinary. That doesn't mean he wasn't great and wasn't a middleweight champion and fought terrific guys, but he was a very ordinary fighter. The Jack Johnson fight, going for middleweight to heavyweight, and actually standing in the ring with the guy for a few rounds. Can you imagine, you know, uh, 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 Mayweather today, uh, or not Mayweather because he's such a stink-out fighter, but a Martinez in the ring with Klitschko today. You'd say, forget it. It's, there's no chance. The, the fighter can hit Klitschko on the chin and nothing is going to happen. But Ketchel was in the ring with uh, uh, Johnson, and that's what we see. But if you took Ketchel out of 1908 and put him in the ring with Carmen Basilio, of a 1953, it'd be no contest. Basilio would just, you know, it, it would be a one-round fight. That doesn't mean that Ketchel did not have a legend attached to him, but that legend was the fight with Jack Johnson. 
speaking of Jack Johnson, he's my next one, all-time great. Uh, was he great and why? Well, he was great for longevity, even though it wasn't that long. Uh, he fought in a fight that was perhaps next to Louis Schmeling and Ali Frazier, the most pressure-packed fight in the history of boxing. And that, of course, was the uh, Jim Jeffries fight in Reno in 1910. To have the whole country looking down at you, and not as a hero, and not as a favorite, but hated and despised, and uh, fighting through that time period, fighting through that the pressure of the pre-fight, fighting the fight, fighting a guy who was a legend, and winning, uh, that made him stand out. If that fight was taken away, he would have had some very nice victories over, over Ketcho and uh, some of the other guys in that time period that were okay. But if you put him, took him out of 1910 and put him in the ring with Joe Frazier, you know, it's a two-round fight. That doesn't mean he wasn't great, but that one particular fight of Jim Jeffries under that pressure makes him stand out. Joe Gantz, uh, was he an all-time great, and uh, why? He was uh, a dance again. The um, amount of fights he had back then at the turn of the century, uh, the fights with Nelson in, in Goldfield, Nevada, with thousands of people outdoors. Uh, he was a very crafty guy, very one-dimensional. There was no head motion. He stood straight up. Of course, many of the fights back then went you know, 30, 40, 40 rounds in great shape, but very one-dimensional. The guys that came after, the slicker guys, like perhaps a Tony Canzanieri, or definitely Roberto Duran in that, in that lightweight, featherweight division, uh, it would have been unfair because... Uh, they were much too slick for, for a guy like Gant. That doesn't mean he wasn't great, but the fighters that came after had a lot more uh, work that they were able to review and a lot more trainers to listen to to make them perhaps a little more than one-dimensional. And that's what Gant was, was one-dimensional. He still was great, but the guys that followed were better. Hey, you know, Steve, uh, I wonder what it was like for, for Joe Gant's uh, in Goldfield, Nevada, when it was over 100 degrees in, in the 27th round, and somebody says, here, you want a sip of water? <laughs> how, how, how refreshing could that – by the way, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the water was in glass bottles, uh, no ice, no nothing on, on uh, ringside. I mean, how refreshing could that have been? Well, not only that, the, the interesting thing is that uh, the gloves back then, of course, were four-ounce and six-ounce gloves. They were very tiny. Uh, very rare that the fighters actually wore mouthpieces. So uh, the type of shots they got hit with back then, you know, uh, who was accredited to the first? Uh, Ted Kid Lewis, because uh, his um, uh, teeth were so bad, he was uh, prescribed a mouthpiece by his dentist in the, you know, in, in the in the teen, late teens, early twenties. But no mouthpieces, and small gloves. Uh, the type of strength those fighters had to be able to take those shots and keep coming back. That's one thing that they may have over the fighters of today, that tenacity to stay in there under the tremendous heat with the small gloves and no mouthpieces. You know, if you told Mayweather you're fighting with six-ounce gloves and no mouthpieces, he may pass on the fight, but those guys did not. <laughs> he, does, he passes on fights even uh, <laughs> with <laughs> today's stuff. Sam Langford, man, was he, uh, was he great and why? He was interesting because he was a little slicker than the fighters of that time period. He fought a lot of great fighters, and he, and he fought, fought a lot of heavyweights. Uh, and he was a little slicker. His hands, like most of the fighters in that time period, his hands were down, which, you know, the way Johnson fought and Gans fought and Ketchel, they all, all fought like that. But he did have a little more motion to him. He did move around a little more. He did move his head a little bit. And, of course, he was a, he was a good puncher. Um, it, it would have been great to see him in a different era uh, uh, perhaps where he could fight some more white fighters and he could fight some white heavyweights or white light heavyweights and see what he would have done. But he was, he was to me, more attractive as a fighter than some of those others because of that more than one-dimensional. He was a little slicker than the others. Henry Armstrong, was he great and why? Well, Armstrong, uh, you know, next to, uh, you know, Robinson and Duran, uh, you have to, or I would have to, uh, consider him the, the greatest fighter of all time. Uh, the, the longevity, number one. Uh, having 
been the champion of three different divisions at the same time. There was a featherweight, lightweight, and welterweight, fighting all those guys, fighting at a very low weight and challenging for the middleweight championship against, uh, was it uh, Sefrino Garcia, and fighting a 10-round draw. Uh, the, the type of fighter he was, more than anything, makes him stand out. The way he never took a backward step, always in your face. A guy like that today, Armstrong, if he was fighting, would be a billionaire fighter. A guy came coming through at you, throwing punches for three minutes around, bobbing and bobbing, hitting you with his head. That's the one thing that the uh, referees would have a problem with today, the uh, head head stuff. But the tremendous forward motion and the punching power with the longevity, definitely one of the greatest of all time. You know, the funny thing is you make a great point. He'd be a billion-dollar fighter, you said. But the problem is, is today's fans and today's uh, t- television networks and promoters, you know, a guy like Henry Armstrong, he lost. He's not undefeated. And uh, you wonder if, if their opportunities would have been, uh, you know, cut short because, uh, you know, they were they were real fighters. They took a loss. They moved on. They learned from it and fought again. I, I wonder if that would have uh, hindered his bank account. Well, let's take a look at him during his prime, you know, when he was fighting as uh, against uh, Ross, for example. That time period, he was... That three or four time, year time was undefeated against some of the great fighters of the era, and um, uh, whether it was Montanez or Ross, that time period when he was undefeated. If you took him out of that time period and placed him in the ring today, uh, that type of fighter with those type of victories against the fighters today would be a tremendous draw. His ring style coming forward—it's almost like a miniature miniature Mike Tyson. That type of fighter attracts an audience. It's like having a baseball player that you know he's going for a home run every time up. Sure, he's not batting 450. He's only batting 320 or 300. But those crushing shots is what you come to pay to see. And with a fighter like Armstrong or Frazier or Tyson, that's what you come to see in boxing. That draws the biggest audience. And that's why those type of fighters were the biggest money makers, the Dempsey's, the Lewis's, the Marcianos, and, and Tyson's. Armstrong was like that. He was a ferocious fighter. That's what the TV people would want today. Speaking of crushing blows and constantly moving forward, uh, Rocky Marciano. You know, a lot of people talk about him. Uh, they say that he was, uh, you know, came uh, during a weak uh, era. Uh, you know, a lot of people are critical of him today, you know, uh, all these years later. In your opinion, was he a great fighter and why? Uh, Marciano was great somewhat because of longevity, even though it was a short time period from, from 52 to, to 55. But he was undefeated. A heavyweight who was undefeated, heavyweight champion, six or seven title defenses. Um, a white guy helps the fact that he was white. Italian helps the fu- fact that he was uh, uh, famous and, and great. Um, as was told to me, all you can do is fight the guys in your time period and beat them. And that's what he did. Now, in any point in history in boxing, if you take a guy out of 1910 or 1920, whether he was a champion or not, and put him in the ring later on with somebody else, uh, it's, it, it, it's a big question mark whether that fighter would have won. With Marciano, if you took him out of 1953 or 54 at the height of his career and put him in the ring with Joe Frazier or Mike Tyson or Ali, he probably would not have won. But it doesn't mean that his legend wasn't a tremendous asset for boxing. That's a critical point also. What did the fighter do for boxing? What kind of legend did he leave? Was it a good legend or a bad legend? And Marshall's legend, even though he may not have been the greatest heavyweight of all time, his overall legend is is wonderful, and it's a great mark for boxing. See, I agree with that, and I believe that um, I believe that when when you're looking for Hall of Fame fighters, you know, in addition to being great, you know, skill wise, they have to have left their mark on the sport. They they had to have changed the sport in one way, shape, or form a, a, in order to be in a Hall of Fame. Because after all, our Hall is a fame for all the sports. Is supposed to be a showcase so that these athletes are, are not forgotten, you know. And 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 when when people talk to me about Rocky Marciano, of course, you know, being Italian, I you know, he's one of my favorite fighters. But I always say, well, 
he wasn't a great fighter technique wise. You you're not going to watch film of Rocky Marciano with a young fighter and say, "Hey, this is the kind of fighter I want you to be." He does everything wrong. But because of that and because he was undefeated and because nobody could beat him and and because he he had so much heart and he was in such phenomenal shape, that is what I believe why he belongs in a Hall of Fame because he overcame the talent deficiencies. Well, that and his style of fighting. As you said, he wasn't the most technically proficient fighter of all time, but he never took a backward step, and he came at you winging shots. Now, if he was perhaps a little bigger, a fighter like that today in, in 2013, a white guy, Italian, let's say 220, 230, who came in the ring like Marciano winging shots, uh, that fighter would be a billionaire. A white guy who comes in there punching, not just jabbing and staying away like a Klitschko, but coming in there winging, getting hit, but knocking you down and knocking you out, that's the type of fighter that the public would want to see. And a network like HBO would, would lock him in the room and not let him leave until he signed the contract. Unfortunately, he was small. That's a, a mark against him. But that doesn't mean he wasn't great. He was great. Yeah, all those guys that could be doing that now are playing uh, in the Super Bowl in a couple of weeks. You know, <laughs> they're uh, all yeah, those exactly. people. Yes. Um, uh, I got uh, three more for you, uh, and and uh, Joe Lewis. You know, I mean, I, I know that's a stupid question. Of course, he was great. Uh, tell me why. Of course, the the longevity. You know, twenty five title defenses. Yes, there were a lot of guys in there who perhaps were not that great. Yeah, but you know uh, what? Let I, me let me interrupt you. You know, sure. Tony Treem and I actually took a look at at, at those so called bum of the month club. And a lot of those fighters were a lot better than some of the opponents that, you know, fighters get today. I, I, you know, when we really looked at those fighters and, and, and you know, uh, take, took a deep look into their level of opposition and everything else, like uh, two-ton Tony Galento and, and, you know, the fighters along those lines, they weren't really bums, not by today's standard at all. Uh, that's correct. A lot of those fighters were co very competent. Uh, but when you look at the guys, you know, Berman and Brescia and Levinsky and guys like that, even Carnera, they were, they were pretty average, perhaps, because Lewis was so great that he made them look so bad. The fact that he was such a tremendous puncher and took them out so quickly uh, made him, you know, they, they did not look as good. But he did fight some guys who were sensational fighters and won those fights also. You know, the, the Billy Kahn fight, even though uh, Billy was, was, was smaller, uh, he was a sensational fighter. Uh, the uh, first uh, Walcott fight, the second Walcott fight, were huge fights. The, the thing that marks him as a sensational legend, of course, is the second Schmeling fight, which, in my opinion, was the most dramatic sporting event in history. Uh, you know, the whole world looking down at you and seeing what are you going to do now after getting knocked out two years before. The fights, the longevity, all the title defenses, winning against guys, getting cut, getting busted up a little bit, but always winning. Uh, and you throw in there a key thing, his demeanor. His demeanor in the ring and out of the ring was sensational. That's what the public adored about him. And one of the um, uh, great, great legendary journalists of all time, uh, Jimmy Cannon, once wrote of Joe Lewis, he was a credit to his race the human race. Yep. Now, you're not going to get many fighters spoken about like that anymore. You know? No, you're right. You're right. Great point. Uh, Jack Dempsey, was he an all-time great and why? Uh, Dempsey was an all-time great for a couple of reasons. Number one, he exploded into the scene with that great victory over Willard in a fashion, the um, bopping and weaving style coming forward, that had not been seen by anyone to that time period. And that type of style with his uh, Jack Doc Kearns manager and Tex Rickard promoter, those guys were able to put together a, a show, the Jack Dempsey show. And once that show was put together, the way they marketed him and had him fight the guys like Carpentier coming from France to the United States, the million-dollar fight began to take place. The first time in boxing history that the crowds at the box office paid so many bought so many tickets that it equaled a million dollar gate and that's what really catapulted him that's business that's part of of boxing if you can get a fighter who 
is a nice champion, but he discovers the cure for cancer, well, that's going to add to his aura. With Dempsey, it was the crowds that came to see him fight. And that million-dollar gate with Carpentier, the first of a few, and his ferocious boxing style, that made him a, a superstar. And um, but that's what some of the fighters, even the legendary Tommy Burns said, that he, they referred to him as that, that million-dollar fighter, which is, was unheard of. So he was great, that time period, the fights with Tunney, the uh, long count, all of that in one ball game makes for a wonderful, legendary fighter. And finally, I got one more for you, brother, and, and this one's more from the modern times. Uh, uh, and I say modern time, um, a lot of people look at this era as the last great era in the sport. Uh, marvelous Marvin Hagler, uh, should he be considered an all-time great, and uh, why? Hagler was definitely an all-time great. The fights he fought earlier, early in his career, uh, you know, would be on pay-per-view now. Uh, the, you know, the fights against William Monroe and and Hart and guys in Philadelphia going down there uh, to fight with no almost no TV, and then of course winning the championship, uh, the Antiformo fights, and getting into the really big stuff with the Hampshire fights, the Hearns fights, the Durant fights, the Leonard fights. Uh, he was the type of fighter again never took a backward step, came to fight. His persona, while it was dry, there was no negative facet to it in any way. Once again, if a fighter like that was around today, yes, he was a southpaw, and perhaps the public doesn't really uh, gravitate to southpaws that much unless they saw a guy like this, like Marvin Hagler, come into the ring, back the guy down, wing shots, very uh, elusive in the ring, too, did not get hit as quite as much as people thought because he did move his head, but it was his fighting style, especially the critical thing, the, the fight that everyone looks at was the, the Hearns fight, which was perhaps the most exciting fight in the history of boxing. So, yes, yes, he was great. You know, excellent job, Steve. And, uh, you know, I, I, I know uh, so all the viewers and listeners, you know, Steve had no idea what I was going to be throwing at him today. And uh, uh, he, did, uh, he did a great job with that. Uh, just before we uh, we wrap it up here, uh, let's talk a little about your uh, Hall of Fame. Now it's totally open; people can come in and check it out. You got film on display. I, I banged around the website. You got um, uh, stuff people can buy. Uh, some of those Tyson shirts are, are great. Uh, tell us about that. Uh, let's let's plug the uh, Hall of Fame. Uh, uh, why should people come out and uh, and see that uh, at Scores? Well, the uh, exhibit, the Hall of the Boxing Hall of Fame portion of Score. Uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to see the legendary memorabilia. There's stuff in there, the great stuff of Joe Frazier, Muhammad Ali, uh, uh, Joe Lewis, uh, of course, Mike Tyson gloves, trunks, and shoes. The video, which is wonderful to see. In addition, the website now is being developed, and that's a, a monstrous job because of the tens of thousands of photographs that have to be scanned, the hundreds of hours of video, while it's a wonderful uh, thing to review and for me to look at all of the great fights to scan that and, and place on the, on the on the website. That's going to be a wonderful sign for the Boxing Hall of Fame in Las Vegas, so people can see what they will be going to, to in Las Vegas. And in Las Vegas at the Hall of Fame, you get a chance to see baseball, football, basketball all under one roof and see Joe Lewis next to Willie Mays and, uh, of course, Rocky Marciano next to Babe Ruth. So the entire attraction is a wonderful uh, thing to see here in Las Vegas, and it's right next to Titanic and Bodies at the Luxor. Yeah, no, I, I, <laughs> I, uh, I, I love that concept, you know, like all sports under one roof. Uh, you know, it, it's something that, you know, you could do, go and spend a day and, and, you know, check out everything and uh, uh, all in one place. I, I love it. I love it. So, Steve, another great uh, episode. I can't wait for the next one. And uh, hopefully I'm going to be out and seeing you uh, pretty soon. So uh, I'll keep you posted on that, my man. Thanks, Billy. Looking forward to seeing you. All right, Steve. Take care. That's Steve Lott from the uh, Las Vegas Boxing Hall of Fame. Uh, we do our little segment here called In the Ring with Billy C. and Steve Lott. And as you can see, uh, Steve is a, a, an asset to, to this show. And uh, if you're looking for uh, information about the uh, Boxing Hall of Fame in Las Vegas, all you got to do is visit our website, www.billycboxing.com, and click the Las Vegas Hall of Fame boxing banner. It's right there on the front page. You can't miss it. Hey, i got to take a break. We'll be right back. 